you very much. Um, I have to uh, very, I guess my, my, my goal here is to give a very brief description of some of the aspects of inequality as they are currently understood in the, in the case of India. This is work that's drawing almost entirely on, on work with my colleague Himanshu um, as well. I've done a little bit of work on this uh, personally myself directly as well. But it's something that we want to develop and explore as part of this project that Francois has uh, outlined uh, so as to try and get a more solid and substantive picture of what's been going on in India as well. Um, I, I, I guess I, 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 I pointed to a few elements of, of the questions around inequality in India in my earlier presentation this morning, which is looking at the village of Palampur. And in this case, what we're doing here now is looking at the all India uh, level. And I'm going to make just a few remarks in terms of some, some emerging, some initial impressions that we have about aspects of inequality based on um, consumption inequality trends. It's important to emphasize that in India, unlike other, many other countries of the world, the, the, the sort of workhorse of analysis of income distribution and, and poverty and so on in India is the National Sample Survey Organization data. These are well-respected, highly regarded surveys. Uh, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole infrastructure of National Sample Survey data collection was uh, uh, introduced by Mahala Nobis um, decades back. Um, it's a very highly regarded uh, uh, survey instrument that collects very detailed information from very large samples. And that's really where we get most of our information on income distribution or, or or, or distribution of living standards and, and on poverty. And, and then I'll say a few words about income inequality. It's a little bit more, there's a question mark there because those data are just not as readily available. Uh, in response, in some sense, to the lack of good income data, there's an interesting, there is an interest possibly of exploring some of these uh, factor markets more specifically, looking at trends there and looking at what's happening there to try to get a, a sense, if not a, a really precise quantitative sense, at least a, an overall sense of what's going on in the country in terms of the forces that are shaping the distribution of income. And then there is some interesting work and some potential, I think, also on, on, on looking at wealth and, and India's billionaires to get a sort of sense of what might be happening at that top, the top end of the, of the distribution. So just as a quick background, income in uh, uh, GDP growth in India has been uh, uh, very st uh, uh, impressive during the past uh, 20, uh, 30 years or so, uh, averaging at around 5% uh, growth uh, during, since the mid-1980s. There was an interval during the uh, 2000s uh, when growth was really picking up dramatically, and that seems to have fallen back somewhat in, the, in more recent years. Um, but that's basically the overall growth picture, and that's been complemented by, I think, as well known, uh, uh, fairly impressive uh, declines in poverty in India as well. Uh, again, the most recent data that I've seen between 2008, 2009, and 2011, 2012 suggest a, a poverty decline in a, over a short period of time of, 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 of about eight or nine percentage points. And it's you know, really dramatic poverty reduction has been taking place in India in, in recent years. Um, this is what's been happening in terms of consumption inequality. If we go back from 1993 through to 2009-10, we see that uh, rural inequality is the blue line here, has been rising, and that's the, the left axis that we should be looking uh, for the rural Gini coefficient, uh, uh, is rising from somewhere just below 2.26 to somewhere above 0.28 uh, between 1993 and 2009-10. And in urban uh, areas, it's, uh, it's been higher. It's starting at a, 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 growth, a, GD, a Gini of a, around 0.32 and rising to, to somewhat above 0.38 over that time period. So rural inequalities is, 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 is sort of 0.26 to 0.28, and urban inequality has been rising from 0.32 to 0.38. So there has been a rise in inequality. I think there's been a lot of debate uh, um, in India as to whether that's telling a com fully c compelling picture, because there certainly seems to be impressionistic evidence and anecdotal discussion around uh, inequality that su would suggest a much greater rate of increase of inequality uh, than what we're seeing in these, in, in these data. But as I said earlier today, there's, uh, there's, you know, there is controversy around inequality estimates in, 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 uh, in India based on consumption. Is the, is, does it make sense to be measuring, them, measuring inequality on the basis of consumption? Should we be looking at income inequality? Um, do these anecdotal debates around inequality, do they depend more on an absolute notion of inequality as opposed to a relative notion of inequality, which is what we're capturing here? So there's reasons to sort of think and discuss uh, 
what these trends, uh, uh, how these trends should be interpreted. If we look at income inequality, there is no official large scale national uh, survey sort of administered by the statistical organization in India on income, on sort of full income, but there is uh, 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 the human development survey that's sort of administered uh, uh, out of by the National Council for Applied, Amer Applied Economic Research, NCAER, and the University of Maryland um, that has been collecting income data over the years. The, the most recent round that's currently available is from 2004-2005. And it suggests a Gini coefficient at the all India level of 0.52 relative to, and then with a rural and an urban breakdown, both very near the 0.5 level as well. So in terms of income inequality, based on these data, the picture is very different from what we're getting from consumption. We have a much higher level of income inequality based on these data. Now there is a new round of uh, IHDS survey data coming. Uh, it's not currently available, but presumably in the next half year or so, those data will become available, and it will be interesting to see what kind of trends we see from those data. There's also work to be done to gauge and probe and assess how reliable these income data are, how good a picture they give of, 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 of inequality. Um, it should be noted that the National Sample Survey Organization does not collect income data in terms of full income. It's particularly self-employment income that are not collected, but earnings data are available. There are data sort of on wage and employment uh, income, and so there are prospects for at least some investigation of income inequality in terms of earnings inequality for those who are not self-employed. Uh, um, and of course, in India, that is a big group, the self-employed, including most farming households and so on. So the, the national sample survey data do not give us a, a good handle on, on the income inequality that uh, derives to those households. So let me say a few words. I'll try and go quickly about um, so regional inequality within the country. There has been a, a rising trend of, of, of divergence between states in terms of, uh, 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 of average GDP per capita uh, uh, income uh, by state. So that's a sort of, if you think about breaking down the question that Francois has posed about global inequality in countries and countries feeding into the global picture, you know, a similar story can be asked about India and say the states underpinning India, or as I was suggesting earlier today, going all the way down to the village and quite possibly seeing the quite dramatic rising inequality at the village level, and that's being masked with a declining or even or a stable inequality at the, at the aggregate level because of between village or between district or between block differences d diminishing over time. This is an, an area I think that's well worth pursuing with, uh, with further investigation as well. Um, now, just looking at some of the factor shares uh, uh, and looking at sort of sig different components of the economy and trying to get a sense of what might be happening to inequality based on those, we basically have uh, uh, the, the private non-farm sector has increased its share of national income over time. Uh, both agriculture and the public sector have declined in terms of the overall pie uh, uh, in, in India over the years. Um, employment shares show no growth in the organized employment sector and a sharp decline in agricultural wage employment. So there's been a big decline in agricultural wage employment and that's been a, 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 a reflected then, as I also suggested earlier today, in, in rising agricultural wage rates, which we'll come back to. Um, there has been an acceleration in GDP growth, which I pointed to earlier, and that has coincided with a very low employment growth in India over recent decades. There has been very little additional employment created uh, during the growth process that's been taking place. Um, the slowdown has been driven by two factors. There's been mainly a falling employment among women, possibly associated with rising education levels amongst, uh, amongst women, and also a general tendency for women to become less inclined to join the, to enter the labor force as incomes rise. Um, but also a falling employment in agriculture. There's just been declining employment in the agricultural sector. Within the organized sector, there's been a g growing gap between the organized sector salaries and the self-employment self wages. Uh, that has, this has started uh, uh, in the 1990s and has been growing. Uh, uh, so there's kind of growing divergence between the, the wage sector and self-employed sector and those who are earning salaried incomes in the, in the formal sector. And within the organized sector, it's the growth rate of income to managers that has been really rising and a big gap, uh, growing gap between managerial incomes and workers' wages uh, 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 within the organized sector. Um, now, I pointed to this already this morning, the, the non-farm sector has been a big 
part of the story in rural uh, India, and there's been a really dramatic increase in non-farm employment in India, and it's been the, the fastest rates of growth uh, uh, um, in, uh, in recent history. That's been a really dramatic process. Um, but much of the new non-farm jobs are shifts out of the farm sector, which we saw was declining, into the non-farm sector. So it's not really necessarily a net increase in, in employment. Um, and most of the rural non-farm employment is in the casual sector, relatively little uh, growth in the sort of salaried formal sector uh, uh, over these years. Um, major part of the major driver of non-farm sector employment is the construction sector as, a, as opposed to man, uh, manufacturing. So it's not been a sort of industrial, uh, industrialization-led uh, growth process, at least as far as we can uh, uh, discern so far. Um, there's been a shift in the relative terms of trade towards agricultural commodities with food prices rising uh, quite rap rapidly relative to manufactured goods. And we've seen an, an, a very dramatic acceleration of agricultural wage rates in rural areas. And this is probably what's been lying behind this very dramatic and impressive rate of poverty reduction in, in rural India over, over this time period. Um, now, just a few words about India's billionaires, because this is quite an interesting uh, 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 story. And uh, we, we, we're drawing here on, on, on sort of uh, uh, evidence that's been presented in, uh, in various publications uh, by Forbes. Um, in 2010, there were 69 billionaires, and this was up from 13 billionaires in 2004. So a dramatic increase in the number of, of billionaires in India. And the, uh, as an exercise that Himanshu carried out here, which I think is quite, quite interesting, is he tried to break down, in a somewhat arbitrary way, of course, but tried to break down who these billionaires are by looking very carefully at their activities and trying to allocate them to either the, a, a rent-thick sector or a more sort of knowledge intensive sector, where the knowledge intensive sector is primarily IT and pharmaceutical uh, 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 sector. And the rent thick sector are these sectors like minings, uh, metals, construction, land, real estate, telecoms, and so on, where there's some kind of dependence on a relationship with the, 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 the political class that might have been uh, uh, important. And what we see is that uh, uh, in India, a very important fraction of all the billionaires are linked to this rent-thick sector. The IT and pharmaceutical sector do uh, have generated a number of, of billionaires, but is, it's essentially been disproportionately from these rent-thick uh, uh, sectors. If we were to compare this to, say, the U.S., where we see that uh, um, in the U.S. of the, uh, the, um, of the top 20 billionaires in the U.S., eight are from the IT sector, three are from finance, five are from retail, and one is from the media. And of the remaining three, two are from engineer, engineering, and only one is from the real estate sector. It seems as though, you know, there, the rent thick sector is not that big a part of the story. But in India, of the top 20 billionaires, uh, nine are in these rent thick sectors. So there seems to be something going on there as to how these billionaires have come to where they are. So quickly, just a few words about going forward, what we hope to do uh, with this work on, on inequality in India is we would like to probe further the whole consumption inequality story. That's really the bedrock on, on which we can rest with our standard household survey data. And I think there is much more to do, including, for example, looking at alternative inequality measures with some, some recent interesting proposals by <coughs> Professor Subramanian along those lines. Um, also, to, make, to try to explore to what extent can we can we correct for underreporting? Uh, I, I do agree with Francois that it's a, it's, it requires heroic efforts, and I'm not sure that I have the courage to do it, but perhaps somebody else can be uh, 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 encouraged to, to, to participate in that part of the, of, of the, of the exercise. We want to look at some trends in the income inequality with these new IHD, IHDS data. I think there's scope for doing uh, wealth analysis, wealth in, uh, distribution analysis. I had a few words with Jim Davies in, in, in Copenhagen in early June, and he was pointing to the data being available in India to lend, that do lend themselves to some analysis of wealth inequality. So it would be useful to look at trends in wealth inequality and see to what extent they're consistent with what we know uh, from other sources of data. I think. Personally, I feel that the subnational inequality story is an important one as well. We would do want to pursue uh, that as well to see to what extent we see a similar process underway within India as what Francois has been pointing to at the all at the global level. I think we will have to pursue and continue working with these factor uh, shares uh, simply because of the lack of very good uh, large-scale income data. 
We do also want to look at non-income dimensions of, 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 of well-being as well and try to look at some trends in inequality along those dimensions as well. And ultimately, it would be nice also to pursue further analysis in the line in the direction of mobility. And there might be some uh, uh, methods and techniques available to us for that purpose as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you.